Welcome everybody to my 2017 Swift Escape 674. This van was purchased um, just after the just after the last lockdown. Um, so 2021. I bought this and it was just over three years old. Um, I used to have a Volkswagen T5 camper van. Um, so this was supposed to be an upgrade to that. Um, I didn't intend to get something as big as this, I'll be honest. Um, and having bought it, I actually thought I might have made a mistake. But since then, I've grown to love it. So I thought I would show you around show you the things that it has, um, the things that I like, the things that I don't like, um, what I would change, what I have changed. Um, so I just thought I'd give you a guided tour um, and I thought this would be particularly useful for anybody who's interested in buying a 674. So let's show you around the van. So in the cab area you've got the normal Fiat Ducato cab. Um, I believe it's the same as the Peugeot Boxer and the Citroen Relay. Um, you've got um, map lights, reading lights there on on sticks that you can bend around. Um, so they're, they're quite handy. Um, you've got the cupboards underneath the bed. This is the bed. I'm sure I'll show you that from a distance in a second. Um, don't pay too much attention to that. I'll explain that area in a minute because that should be a sofa. So originally I was looking for a smaller van, but one with a fixed bed. I wanted a fixed bed. I was tired of making up the bed in the Volkswagen T5 that we'd had before. I just wanted something that was easy and I needed something that had got a shower in it. Um, they were basically the, the tick boxes to have. And this one basically has a fixed bed. It's a drop down bed above the front dinette. So it's a manual bed in this one. Um, so you, you press the button up here and ease the bed down. And then that's basically the, the height that you sleep at. And there's a ladder under here, which ladder fits on there so that makes for a, a nice comfy bed which is quite handy and easy to get to So that kind of ticks that box, although not quite. Um, but I have to say that from a daytime perspective, it's great to get that bed up out of the way because then you get to use the space that it occupied for daytime activities instead of having a bed that was stuck in the middle. Um, I know there are models that are very similar layout to this. Uh, one that's got a center island bed, basically where this lounge is here. Um, Another that's got um, kind of twin beds, again, at the back here. Um, another that's got a bed at that side and then the bathroom here in this corner, um, which have all got the pros and the cons. But I think all of those rely then on having just one lounge area. And that's the one just behind the driver's seat. So you, you've immediately limited yourself to just one area. Um, while 
to start with, I thought this is a complete waste of space. Why have I got two lounges? Actually, this one at the back of the van is a lot more comfortable to sit in than the seats in the front lounge. Um, they just they're just easier to lounge about in. And yeah, it just gives you the option to have two different spaces. So particularly if you've got a family, um, having the kids maybe sat down there while parents are at the back. Um, the TV is halfway between. It can be pointed at that direction. It can be pointed at this direction. It's, um, it's quite flexible. Towards the middle of the van, you've got the habitation door and the kitchen area. Underneath the kitchen is quite a large cupboard with a cutlery drawer built in there. You will also find that underneath the kitchen cupboard, above the cutlery drawer, you'll find this. And I've seen quite a few people ask on the forums, on Facebook groups, etc. What on earth is this? This is a draining board. So it also, underneath it, this here is a chopping board that fits on top of the sink area. So your chopping board can fit nicely there and give you extra preparation space. Or you can take it away and fit the draining board. Assuming that you're on reasonable level ground or you're tilted this way, the water will run back into the sink. Obviously, if you're not parked very level, you run the risk of the water dribbling off that way. Fits nicely under the cupboard. Job done. The cooker itself has three hobs, three gas hobs, and a graph, a gas grill and oven in there. Underneath is a drill, and then underneath that is a cupboard. One handy feature of the kitchen is this lift up table, which has its own bracket underneath to support it. And it's just a, a one handed operation to put it up and take it away. On the opposite side, immediately in front of you as you walk in the door, you've got the TV. The TV will swivel that way or it'll swivel that way. Next to the TV is the door for the bathroom. It's a reasonable size bathroom. It features the modern shower head, uh, which mixes air with the water to reduce water consumption. Above the towel rail is a nice handy cupboard. Underneath the sink is another handy cupboard with a shelf in it. The shower curtain doesn't quite reach the bottom of the door. There's a gap. But obviously when you're in the shower, the, the water makes the curtain stick to the surface that's behind it. So more often than not, the curtain will stick to the door. So then if the water runs down the curtain, it then runs onto the door and then usually finds its way underneath the door and quite often drips out onto the hallway. So we end up putting a towel down, pushed against the outside of the door, just to catch any water that runs underneath the door. Bit annoying. Issue number two with the bathroom is that in the shower tray, there's only one plug hole. I know, th first world problems and all that, but if, you, if you're not exactly flat, um, then the water can often run to the opposite side of the shower tray to where the plug hole is, which means that you've got to sit there scraping the water into that direction. It'd just be great 
if it had two plug holes in diagonal corners. I know some of the newer vans have those, um, so it'd just be nice, wouldn't it? So this particular model of the 674 is one of the dealer special editions. So this particular one came from Brown Hills and because it came from Brown Hills, it is badged up Champagne. That's their um, special edition brand name, if you like. And with the Champagne, um, you get some extra features. So the, uh, the cab has got a leather steering wheel, leather gear knob, um, you get the sat nav, I think. Um, in the back, you get um, a window in the habitation door with a bin in the door. Um, the there's also a solar panel um, to charge the leisure, but well, to charge both batteries up actually. Um, so there's there's various features that are added. It comes with its own upholstery as well. This particular color scheme is part of that special edition. Um, and where in the front headrests it usually says escape I think um, in this one it says champagne um, so just subtle differences really um, but there, there's some quite nice features built into the special edition ranges um, so the other dealerships some of the bigger dealerships around the country have their own special edition ranges um, different colour paints our cab is gold um, other dealerships have um, like a light blue or a grey, um, whereas the standard van is generally a white van. One of the other nice things about this van is it holds quite a lot of fresh water. Now that's not necessarily a massive issue if you're spending your time on campsites, but we like to do a lot of off-grid um, wild camping if you like um, so having everything on board is quite important so in this van i believe it's got a hundred liter fresh water um, storage tank whereas some of the others are quite a lot smaller than that um, some are maybe 50 60 liters um, so it makes quite a big difference so that fresh water tank if there's only a couple of you in here, it could last you all week. Um, the waste tank is not quite as big, that's 75 litres, uh, but still it's, it's quite a, a good size. Um, again, the fresh water is actually inside the van. It's underneath one of the front seats, where one of the, the two travelling seats in the back of the van sit on top of the fresh water. Um, the waste tank is underneath the van and there's a heater in, I believe there's a heater in both tanks. Um, so they, they call this a winterized van um, because there's various aspects of it that are designed to be used in very cold conditions. Um, to the right of the bathroom is the fridge. which is a fridge freezer. It's got a fr freezer box at the top. It's a nice handy size. Uh, there's a cupboard above and there's a cupboard below. At the back of the lounge, there's a wardrobe to the side. And in the wardrobe, is the table and on the other side is the table extension and behind here is the chrome leg for the table. Above the lounge are cupboards all the way around So this is our food cupboard, or one of our food cupboards, but it's the one that's got the shelf in it. We noticed quite quickly that this shelf was sagging and didn't look too great. So one of the things that I did fairly quickly was created a couple of shelf supports here. And literally all they are is a little bit of laminate floor. And I've cut two pieces same size, put them back to back so that they're faced nicely on both sides, glued them together. 
put one there, put one there, and it stops the shelf sagging. You can move them about to fit different bits of um, food. Um, <laughs> again, it's a, a quick, simple hack, but it stops the shelf sagging. And that's the main thing. The oven. The oven is a source of rattles. You're driving along, you will hear the oven rattling. Unless you realise that the shelf that you put into the oven is the source of the mo most of the rattles. And then, if you also realise that there's a proper storage way of parking it, if you like, that stops most of the rattles completely. So let me show you. The shelf here is caught between this chrome rail and a black plastic knob, if you like, there, and another one at the back. Under there. And between them, they hold this and stop it bouncing so much. Because when you lift, when you leave this shelf on this rung here or that one, it just rattles all the time while you're driving and drives you insane. Above the kitchen, there's another handy cupboard. And above the kitchen over here, we have the microwave. And then moving across, back across to the top of the door, we have the control panel for both the heating and the main system for all of the van electrics. And then these are the waste valves and fresh water valves for dropping the water out when you're draining the system down. The electrical control panel. Both the sergeant control panel here and the Truma um, heating control panel there. Both of them, you can set the time on them, but they'll never keep the time. So if you try and do anything with a timer, well, it, I've no idea why. I've never really bothered to find out. If I really wanted to find out, I reckon I could probably fix it, but I believe it's a common issue. Um, so yeah, bit annoying but I don't really use the timer that much anyway. Well, I can't, but I don't really feel that I need to. So the waste level sensor is this side. The freshwater sensor is this side. So you, you get blocks to tell you how many, how much water you've got in, in as the fresh, and you get blocks to tell you how many, how much water you've got in your waste tank. This one will all of a sudden decide that it's absolutely full and it will set the alarm off. So in the waste tank, there's a series of rods each one's electrical conductor and they're all different lengths so as the water rises it touches the bottom of different lengths of rods the problem is that over time there's deposits get stuck to the outsides of these rods and they suck the water up and make a contact between the end of the rod and the top of the rod even though there's no water there so you've only got to splash it and all of a sudden it's made contact on the sensor that says that the tank's full so the the fix really is to get underneath the van there's an inspection um, cap on the bottom of the waste tank um, so if you take the ex the cap off you can actually reach in and if you're careful you can you can clean those rods and once i'd done that um, it made a massive difference. It, I'm not saying it never happens, but it hardly ever happens now, whereas it was happening all the time before. So that's just one thing to bear in mind. Again, I can't imagine it's unique to this range of motorhomes. I'm pretty sure that that's common in lots of motorhomes, but that's, um, yeah, it's a niggle. So another issue these switches here correspond to the fresh water tank and the wastewater tank. And when you flick one of them on, then it opens the valve on the waste on the dump side outside of the van. So if you catch the fresh water switch accidentally, it'll dump all your fresh water on the floor.
same for the west for, same for the waist um however they're also prone to failing so it doesn't matter what you do up here um you quite often have a situation where the actual solenoid on the waste outlet fails and so you you can't open it at all um so both of mine have gone um at the moment i've had to remove them and i use a a pair of pliers to open the valve manually outside i will be replacing them um but again they won't be unique to this model or this range but um it's something to be aware of it might be that i used them in sub zero temperatures and i tried to turn one on in fact i tried to turn both of them on and they both basically failed at the same time so um, I think uh, one seized completely and one snapped its little shaft um, that it turns. So they both failed for different reasons, but probably from the same cause. One good thing about this panel and also the uh, the panel that comes on the newer vans, um, you can connect your phone. There's an app for it. Um, so you can connect your phone to that and you can control the lights. You can turn the water on and off. Um, you can control the heating um, so yeah it's quite nice um, it's nice to be able to do that um, another thing that I thought I'd mention to you is you can see there's there's LED strip lights above all of the cabinets all the way around the van um, they're great they're really nice but they don't have consume power so if you're actually off grid and you've not got a hook up um you might not want to be using them so you can turn them off and you can still use cabinet under cabinet lights around the van but um the the top lights they they do consume power something else to mention about the control panel in the control panel there's a, a hidden system menu and in there you can choose how the solar panel is used to charge the different batteries so you can have it so that you can just simply charge the leisure battery or you can have it so that it simply charges the vehicle battery or you can have it set to smart but the smart setting by default charges the vehicle battery until the vehicle battery is fully charged and at that point it will then charge the leisure battery quite often it takes quite a lot to charge the vehicle battery so you could be actually running your leisure battery down particularly in winter and not really getting any benefit from the solar so i quite often switch that system so that it's charging only the leisure battery particularly if we're driving around a lot and it's unlikely that the vehicle battery is going to die. Another very handy feature on the 674 is the room divider curtain. So it just allows you to separate yourself from the kids. So the kids are either in here or the kids are out there. One thing though that you don't get in these earlier versions of the 674 is much in the way of power at the back of the van so in this area as standard there isn't really anywhere to charge any devices um, so the, i think the closest you really get is these main sockets which i suppose is okay if you're on a campsite and you're on electric hookup but if you're not you really could do something else so i've added some features to this one myself i added these sockets down here so there's so there's two usb sockets there there's two usb sockets here and down here is a, a, a regular auxiliary socket like you get in your car so let's talk about the front lounge well the front lounge is quite nice there's plenty of space. There's a sofa this side. There's a sofa this side. But what I found 
was that this driver's seat couldn't really spin around properly because the sofa at this side stuck out too much and this just bumped into it so it's okay but it'd be nice if it faced the traveling seats um, so you can have a proper conversation but also to be able to maybe have the table here um, I spend a, a fair amount of time working in my van on a computer so that's okay I could sit at the back with the lounge and the table but if you sat at any length of time then what you could do with doing really ha is having a bit more of an ergonomic seat and the driver's seat is perfect it's almost like an office chair so I've modified this van so that I've basically got rid of this part of the sofa it literally just meant taking one cupboard away with its corresponding cushions and then I've created a little bit of a step um, no major changes to the actual van structure but um, it just allows me to spin this chair around and have a table here there's a few things that I'm not quite as happy about with this van stupid bed cushion designs this is supposed to be a double bed the way that they fixed this there's not enough cushions to fill the gaps so this cushion doesn't come out far enough to the edge of the bed so what they do is they provide you with some grey box um, fabric covered like this um, but they're bl basically blocks of cushion covered in that that fit in these gaps which means that when you're traveling you've got to find somewhere to keep those grey blocks which means you're using a cupboard up just for infill cushions and it's the same at the front the front bed is exactly the same you make that up you need infill cushions to make it a proper size um, lots of these larger motorhomes have quite large garage storage spaces and this one one of its bigger issues for me is that the um, outside locker space is limited to just half of that sofa bench there there's a small rectangular access panel to get into underneath that sofa and that's all there really is for putting things from outside so leveling ramps um got uh, uh, camping chairs um those sorts of things that's the only place you can really put them um unless you're going to keep, keep them temporarily somewhere like maybe in the bathroom while you're traveling but if we we like to have things packed away that's really that area for us is filled with a set of leveling ramps two garden chairs um, a portable solar panel and that's pretty much it or the, the charging cable the electric hookup cable um that that's that's all we can really fit in that so that's a little bit awkward i'd like a larger garage but it works um it's, it's enough to get by so yeah you can't grumble too much everything's a compromise let me show you the cab blinds so in the windscreen we've got these nice pleated blinds with magnetic catch down the middle lovely proper motorhome stuff at the sides i don't know what they're thinking i know that you can get the same pleated effect blind that they've got in their window i know you can get it for the side blinds but they haven't they've put these thermal ones on instead which are press stud connected to the frame i just don't like that i'd rather have the pleated blinds so we take those blinds off and we have to store them up here 
there's reasonable storage in the back here. Um, under here, there's storage, but don't forget I told you that this area is the only bit that's accessible from outside. So you want to use that area for things like levelling ramps. This area here, you can get to from outside if you take this stuff out of the way, uh, but it's a little bit more awkward. So that's just general stuff. Uh, the wheel arch is in that corner, so that takes up a bit of space. Similar uh, situation over this side, although it's slightly smaller. Um, we use this just for generally anything. Um, we we'll occasionally take a kayak with us, that might go in there. Um, rucksacks, blankets, just generally picnic blanket, all those sorts of random stuff, they go in there. Let me show you something else. There's a hidden cupboard. I know. Why would you have a hidden cupboard? When the van is new, there's a bit of wood across the top of here, so you don't see these rungs. And I can understand why that's there, because when you make the bed, you pull this out along with all the rungs and then there's nothing over here so that at least that piece of wood would support the middle cushion when it's made into a bed. I get that. However, there's not really any easy way to get into that storage because that bit of wood doesn't lift up, it's screwed down. But that storage in there is massive. So when we first bought this van, I panicked a little bit, if I'm honest, and I felt that there wasn't enough storage in the van. So I bought one of those um, full back racks with the back box, storage box on it that fits on the tow bar. And for a few months, I carted that around with basically the things that are in here now. Until I realised that I could get to this storage by just li literally removing that piece of wood, it allowed me to get almost everything that was in that massive box on the back of the van, I could get into here. So I dispensed with the box and the rack and I just lived with this instead. So it's worth knowing that that storage space is there. Yes, you can get to it, there's a hole in that end. You can get to it from outside through all your stuff that's in the garage box, garage cupboard, and you can just about get into this area. But this area is quite big and the hole that goes into it is quite small and it's awkward to get to. So I don't know how you were supposed to get things in and out of that. This side's no better because in this corner is the boiler. So you can't get into this cupboard from this side because the boiler's in the way. So just be aware that that's there and it's that's a good size storage. So we put all kinds of things in here. The ground sheet goes in here. Um, tools some sometimes go in there. We, we did have the Kadak in here. Um, at one point we were carrying the, the standard Fiat toolkit that lives under the passenger seat. That came and lived in here for a while um, because I've used that space for something else. Um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of space in here. It's worth considering. We went to Scotland last year. We went and did the NC500. Fantastic. On the way back, it was quite a journey. We decided to do quite a lot of it all one go. And halfway back, the um, the camera, the rear camera stopped working, the reverse camera. And there was a smell of burning plastic. So we stopped as soon as we could and we had a look around. By that time, the smell had almost gone away. Um, but the camera had, was still not working. And so I then spent a few days trying to work out what I was going to do about the camera. Well, not the camera, but the screen 
above the, the reversing camera mirror screen. And I did some research trying to find a replacement that would fit. Somebody on social media picked up on what I was searching for and suggested that I ought to look at whether it was actually that that had gone wrong. And they suggested having a look at Fuse 13 in the fuse box. Uh, that's very specific, isn't it? It's basically the fridge fuse in the fuse box. And I thought, well, <laughs> yeah, it sounds completely unrelated, doesn't it? But lo and behold, fridge fuse 13 in the fuse box had melted. It hadn't blown, it had melted. The plastic, it was a blade fuse, and the plastic of the blade fuse had melted. It had just got hot and hotter and hotter and hotter and just melted itself. And the smell of burning plastic was the fuse melting. So when I came to find the fuse box a few days later, I discovered the fuse. And at that time, the fuse was relatively still intact, although it had broken to the point where it couldn't conduct electricity. Therefore, it wasn't working, which is why the camera went off, because the camera is on the same circuit as the fridge when the fridge is in travelling mode, so taking charge from the engine. So replacing the fuse in the fuse box made the camera work again. It's very scary to think that that fuse melted. And I was very concerned about that. And I contacted Sergeant who make the electrical system for Swift. And I asked them because people online were saying, oh, you just need to make the fuse a, a higher capacity. And I think it's a 15 amp fuse and, and they suggest it should be a 20 amp. Um, I spoke to Sergeant and they said, yes, they're right. Um, if, if I remember correctly, I think they said, if you've got the full height fridge in your motorhome, rather than the under counter fridge, if you've got the full height fridge, then it's safe and they're, in their words, recommended to change the fuse to a 20 amp fuse instead of a 15 amp fuse. Therefore, it runs cooler and it's less likely to have that effect again. I hope you enjoyed my review of the 2017 Swift Escape 674. We've had it for two years. I've grown to like it, actually. There's quite a few niggles with it, but actually I quite like it. So I'm sure you will too. Um, if you found any issues with your van or you have any hints and tips that you can add for other people, please put them in the comments below. And please do me a favour. If this is useful to you, please, please click the subscribe button and click the thumbs up. And don't forget to click that notification bell so that you find out when I release new videos about the Swift Escape range. Catch you on the next one.